drivers behind the line. and welcome to season four episode three of behind the lines where we bring the experts to you i'm evan morrison joining me from robo sports network is clinton bollinger and this week is scouting 101 tonight's episode will focus on the start where to start with gathering information how to determine what data to collect and high-tech and low-tech solutions available to teams Joining us on air tonight are two of the top performing teams in first, 1678 the Citrus Circuits and 2056 OP Robotics. Before we hand it off to our experts, we need to mention that the views expressed by Behind the Lines and the guests are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of first and first participants. Don't forget that you can submit questions to us throughout the show by tweeting at RoboSportsNet with hashtag FRCBTL, by posting a message on our Facebook page, or by typing exclamation point Q into the Twitch stream chat. With that, we're really excited to have our two well-versed experts with us today. We'll let them introduce themselves. Oliver, you go first. So hi, my name is Oliver. I'm a scouting and strategy mentor on Team 2056. Um, I've been part of FIRST since 2005, and I've been part of Team 2056 since 2011. Um, so my role at competition is mostly to watch over the kids as they do scouting for us. And then when it comes time to make a pick list, I'm the one at the computer going over all the data, uh, trying to figure out what to do. I'm uh, Richard McCann. I'm the uh, strategy and scouting mentor for 1678, as well as a couple other roles on the team. And I'm Mark, Mike Corsetto's chief stylist as well. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sam. I'm a senior at high school and I'm the app programming lead of the robotics team and I oversee the scouting system development. Hi, I'm Janet. I'm a junior on 1678 and I'm the team strategist. Awesome. Well, welcome. We're super excited to have um, all of you on tonight. Obviously, some uh, some of the top strategic and scouting minds in first here. So um, we'll get right into it. Uh, up first, uh, Citrus Circuits. Let's uh, let's get going. So uh, we call this presentation Money Bots, uh, and we have Steve Harvey is on our our movie poster uh, because he's our, our he's our lead mentor on our team. Um, the, I want to start with the principles of money bot scouting, which is really a derivative of the revolution in sports stats, where teams have looked for the value of particular players and how important those players are in each uh, role that they are on the field. This is um, where Moneyball came from, the, the famous book and movie that was done on the Oakland A's in the early 2000s. Um, and Oliver is actually going to dig more into that sports stats in his presentation, which will be interesting to see. Um, we also, uh, one of our principles is um, combining quantitative and qualitative data in a way that allows us to do the ranking. And we really want to keep things simple and transparent. Oops, the slide will go. Um, I want to start with the most fundamental uh, basis of any of your scouting system, which is understanding the game. And you need to understand that your strategy defines what you're scouting for. You need to know all the rules and keep track of all the ways that you can score points and where you're, uh, how you get ranking points. Um, and again, Oliver's going to actually dig a lot more into his presentation on this. And we're going to, we're going to talk more about the logistics and the management of the scouting system and some of the other principles that we use in doing our calculations. What we're looking for is a certain set of alliance attributes. We have what we want in our first pick robot, which is a role that complements what we've built our robot to do. And then our second pick robot really fix, fills the gaps um, that the other two ro robots are not able to fill. And we're really looking for value added attributes. We don't expect these robots to do a lot of offenses, other things on the field that we're looking for them to do. Um, we try to design a system that is simple in structure, in structure, that it's easily understood, that you can observe everything on the field, and that, um, and we're also uh, satisfied approximating certain values that we use. We're not looking for precision. We're looking for something that's transparent and simple. And with that, I turn it over to Sam. Uh, 
Okay, so the, all these stats that we report are either quantitative or qualitative. And uh, quantitative includes uh, data such as how many high goals shot or how many gears placed. And qualitative um, includes rankings of driver abilities, uh, quality such as um, ball control, gear control, defense, etc. And the quantitative attributes can be found in auto, in teleop, and the end game. And we convert abstract values into discrete values. So in uh, 2014, we had the aerial assist game where defense did not necessarily have points assigned to them, but they did still have value. And we came up with a way to give them a quantitative value. In 2017, this goes through with gears and rotors. So rotors were the ones that actually got the points, but gears contrib contributed to the rotors. So we placed a value on number of gears. and qualitative ranking. So there is a big difference between driver ability versus robot speed and quality such as robot speed. Some teams may think that driver ability could be just about speed or how well a robot swiftly uh, goes around obstacles. But a lot of a driver ability has a lot of um, attributes to it, such as speed, uh, defense, and ball control. And we use ordinal ranking in, in the match. We have super scouts that um, use ordinal ranking such, uh, that ranks robots and their performance one through three. Uh, we don't do cardinal ranking where we assess a robot based on all the robots in the field. We assess robots based on other robots in that alliance. So we do the transit, transitive property that if, if robot A is uh, better than robot B and robot B is better than robot C, then robot A must be better than robot C. And now we'll go into our actual technical side of the system. Uh, we have a Bluetooth system for our scouting system. We use Bluetooth for internet, uh, giving internet to the tablets. The tablets use the internet to send data to an online database. And uh, it's easy to troubleshoot as uh, Bluetooth is easy to um, fix when uh, internet connection disconnects uh, during the competition. And uh, we have a uh, scouting interface that includes buttons that's uh, very simple to use for the user. It's just clicking buttons that records data and we have um, uh, smooth data transfer. Okay, cool. And hardware, we have we use tablets for the scout app that the scouts use up in the stands during the competition. And we use, once again, Bluetooth system to uh, give internets to the tablets so that the tablets can send data to an online database. And we also use smartphones that um, we rely on the team members and the mentors to possess already um, and give them a data a app called a viewer data, a viewer app that uh, allows them to view all the calculated data and all the data that the scouts collected throughout matches. And software we use, um, uh, let's see, yeah, we use iOS and Android apps. Android apps are used for the Scout app and iOS uh, devices hold the iOS Pit Scout and the Viewer. And the Android, we also have a Viewer for an Android. So I mentioned the Scout. The Scout app collects the uh, quantitative data and these are objective data that can be observed on the field. Um, it's very straightforward and um, it's a simple user interface, so we have an auto page, we have a tele page, and we have an end game. We collect end game data as well. So uh, we have buttons for the uh, users to click, and yeah, we have then a Super Scout app that collects subjective data. And we assign two very experienced FRC scouts that have past experience in scouting, and they have the responsibility to communicate with one another to define um, what rank to give a robot. And these ranks include drive and uh, ball control, defense, all these attributes that contribute to driver ability. And here you can see some examples of the, the Scout app. So at the top, you see a, U, a UI 
for the SCADA of 2017 season. And you can see we collect data such as ground gear intakes, we have gears fumbled, and we have uh, buttons that actually have more features uh, such as timing. And that has, as for ready for liftoff, which when clicked, it starts a timer and that times a robot and how long it takes to reach the, plat uh, the, what's it called? the, the climb uh, platform. And on the bottom UI, you see the Super Scout. And Super Scout, we have we have uh, buttons that rank uh, rank robots based on drivability, uh, not drivability, sorry. We have agility, ball control, and defense, and speed, which all contribute to driverability. And we have viewers. So viewers are the apps that. Um, the end users such as mentors and teammates use to, um, to see the stats of other robots and the data that's viewed are all accumulated throughout past matches and it's updated um, live so every time you see it you're looking at the latest data that's been collected by the scouts and the data that's viewed are actually calculated data that our server, um, server in the background calculates uh, data such as averages, z-scores, and standard deviations from raw data input. And here you see some UI examples of the viewers. So on the left, you see the Android viewer, and you can see there displays data such as disabled percentage, incapac in incapacitated. incapacitated percentage, and uh, average gears, and yeah, data such as that. We have on the right, the iOS viewer, which looks very similar and displays the same uh, data points. And we'll pass it to Janet. All right, so at the competition, we use data to help us prep our strategies for each of the matches. Sweet. So each year we bring a travel team to our in-season competitions, and most of that travel team is made up of our scouting team. So our scouting team has one head scout, which allots the, uh, the shifts for scouting and gives certain people breaks while other people are busy scouting. And then we have two programmers, one of which is a server programmer and one of which is a scout programmer. And they help fix things if anything breaks and make sure the server is running properly. By the way, no nothing ever breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's perfect. <laughs> yeah, and then we also have scouts who sit in the stands. They're the bulk of the people who are there taking live data. Normally, we try to have two to three scouts per robot. So we make sure that even if one scout messes up, we have two other people who can help affirm the data or negate it. And then we have a strategy team. Currently, this is made up of only me, and I go around for each of the upcoming matches, and I talk to the people on our alliance, and I assess the other opponent, opposing robots. And then from there, I look at what strategy we should play and what auto routines we should run as an alliance, and then I communicate that with all of our alliance teams, our team members. And then we have scout training sessions. Those are typically before the uh, actual competitions. And during those training sessions, we uh, have scouts trained by scouting old matches or week, week one matches. <laughs> okay, cool. And then we also have a pit scout. The pit scout is typically someone who has a little bit more experience who goes into the competition pits the night before actual qualification matches start. And they are busy taking pictures of all of the robots and inputting data on their pits. So some of the data we gather is drivetrain and team organization, and those two help us during pick night or like draft night to help determine which team we should pick. And then the pictures are used so that the mentors can easily identify robots. And then this year we also had a, we always have this data point called canned cheesecake, in which case a cheesecake is, cheesecake is like a mechanical addition we can add to some other robot to help improve their ability. So this year we had like a climb mechanism that we could attach to other robots. And then we would look at the available weight of a robot and see if we could attach that climb mechanism to that robot. Okay, so we used, I use this data in match planning, which I received from the iOS viewer because I'm an iOS iPhone. And then I use this data to help me prepare pre-match strategy sheets, which are these laminated sheets that have the match field on them where I can draw out the designs, like the pathway our robot should take or the pathway that other robots on our line should take. 
And I use the data to help confirm or deny the strengths and weaknesses of our teams because, like, especially for this year, I can like ask a team, how many gear cycles can you run? And typically they overestimate how much they can run. So the actual data will help me see how they're actually performing currently in this uh, competition. And then this helps me determine the general goal of our alliance. So if we have like strong gear runners, maybe I'd want to go for four rotors. Otherwise, I typically play three rotors and then play defense where I would assign certain teams to play defense on certain robots on the opposing alliance. And then I can also identify the roles that our opposing alliance robots will play. So if I see we have a strong gear runner on a, another team, uh, I might assign one of our team members to go play defense on them. So then at the very end, the night before the elimination matches, we have a draft night, which we create our pick list in. So this is typically a couple of me plus a couple of other mentors. We have Richard, Mike, and Harvey, and they help sit down with us. And then we go through each of the robots on the, at the competition and we determine like where they rank on what we want in our alliance. So we never play like the, we never run our hive mind. We always play devil's advocate on the teams. So we always argue against or for them. And then we play out scenarios like what the other top seated align, uh, team members might like who they might choose for their team. And then we can play our strategy and then based on what they might do. And then we have uh, the next day during the last few qualification matches, two to three people, typically Richard and Harvey, who sit in the stands and they adjust our pick list depending how on how the robots are performing during the last few matches. And then in the end, we make sure to destroy all not correct pick lists to make sure that our captain or our strategist or whoever goes up during alliance selection only has one. And now I pass it over to Richard. And so now we get to the bottom line of our presentation, which is uh, what are the lessons that we learned? And we learned a lot the hard way. So one of the first things is be willing to scrap your scouting system and start over. I think how many times have we done it? Three, three times in since 2013. Um, and you can see some of the things that we've changed along the way that we've learned about. Um, we've added some other features like real-time data uploads so that we have better viewer data, um, uh, recognize the importance of pre-match strategy, and also uh, the real importance of bringing in dinner so that we aren't there until two o'clock in the morning doing the draft. Um, and so with that, um, I like this great quote from the Moneyball movie about how we're looking, using these stats to find the robot that no one else sees. And um, we typically get our second pick robot is, is pretty high up on our draft list in most, year, you know, most events. So we're pretty happy with the results that we've got. Um, and then finally, here's um, how you can get a hold of us. And uh, we have our email address that you can reach. Um, on the fall workshops, there's a much longer version of this presentation from last year, and we will have this year's presentation up probably by the end of November. Uh, we, Sam and I presented this, took about an hour to do it. Um, there's a shorter white paper that we've developed for uh, guiding teams to uh, uh, develop their own systems. And of course, there's longer white papers as well that really delve into detail. Sam, how long is that paper? Like 60 pages? No, we have, we divided it into uh, three sub documents. So we have the white paper now just um, giving the technical overview and we created a different document that used to be part of the old white paper and this is the scout system development guide for other FRC teams. And we have a showcase document that we show judges during competition which is just a summary of our system. So I think the white paper is about 30 pages. 30 pages. Yeah. So. So that's been developed over time and we really um, urge teams to go uh, look for that uh, white paper and, and read it closely. And we're more than willing to help any team with development. There's several teams that have been working on different types of electronic systems that we've talked to about trying to walk them through developing their own system. So with that, we hand it off to Oliver. All right, thanks guys. Let me just get to this presentation. Okay, um, so the guy in 1678 gave an overview of how to build a system overall. What I'm gonna talk about is how to tailor your system um, to collect the data that you wanna have that'll allow you to make the decisions that will let you win. Um, just some housekeeping. This is a very condensed version of the presentation that I gave with Shankar at the 2056 Ways to Inspire conference in 2017. All the materials are available on our website at the link here. Um, if you wanna 
get more information about how to do data analysis and make pick lists, that was the subject of our 2016 presentation. And you can also find that on the website. Um, so let's, let's breeze through this so we can get to the meat of the presentation. What you, what you always want is to have the right information. Um, in order to have the right information, when you're scouting, you need to have the right database or spreadsheet. And in order to have the right database or spreadsheet, you need to be collecting the right information. That's what we're talking about um, when we're talking about scouting sheets. That's what you're using to collect the information, whether it be the tablets if you're on 1678, or on a lot of teams, it's just the, the scouting piece of the paper. Um, usually, the, the sheet will govern the design of the spreadsheet. So what you what your database does depends on what data you're collecting using your scouting sheets. Uh, you need to start with collecting good data with a good sheet, and only then can you move on to having a good database and making a good decision, which will lead you to have the results that you want. Um, so what makes a good scouting sheet? This is what the uh, today's presentation is going to be about. You want your scouting sheet to be able to capture every relevant piece of information that differentiates all of the robots. And the way that you do this is you ask yourself the question, what will I want to know this year? Um, this is very different from asking yourself, what can I scout or what can be scouted? Uh, this is very different from asking yourself, what can robots do this year? Uh, you're trying to tailor your data collection based on the information that you want. Um, and it's not just necessarily going to be the simplest system, um, but it's going to be the right system, which is going to make you make the right decision. Um, as with robot design, strategy has to determine implementation. So if your strategy requires you to uh, pick a certain kind of robot, you need to be collecting data that will allow you to make that decision. Uh, so very quickly, if, if you were asking yourself the question of what can be scouted, um, you might come up with information like this about a basketball player. This shows uh, you know, how many points were scored, how many rebounds they get, how many assists they get, uh, what their percentages were. This is, this is good information, not necessarily what you want to make the best possible decision. If you're asking yourself, what uh, will I want to know this year? And if your question is, uh, you know, how good of a shooter is Andrew, Andrew Wiggins? You would need to collect very different data. Um, if your question is, how good is Andrew Wiggins at playing defense? You'd be collecting very different data. And only when you're collecting the right data uh, can you come to a decision like this, which shows that uh, the player that we were talking about, Andrew Wiggins, is a very, very, very low average defender. Um, so the golden principles of scouting. When you're collecting information, you ask yourself two basic questions. Where did every point come from? And where did every missed point go? Uh, we break this down in a couple more ways. So when we're talking about where every point came from, uh, the most basic way of scoring a point would be to directly score a point. Uh, in, so I give an example from one of each of the last four years. Uh, for example, this year, you could score fuel every, every fuel that you scored or do some fraction of the point. Next, what did robots do that enabled points to be scored? Yeah, this means actions that are directly proximal to having caused a point to be scored. So this means uh, in this year, before you can score a point from fuel, you need to have fuel in your robots. You need to collect fuel. Before you can score a point for having a rotor turning, you need to collect a gear. Um, this also includes other actions that aren't just picking up game pieces. So. Um, in 2015, for example, you could put litter in the recycling container. It wouldn't directly score you a point, but it would allow you to score the points once once the can is placed on top of the stack. Um, also in 2015, if you took a can off of the stack, that would give you access to that can, which would allow you to potentially score it later. So that's the action that needs to be done before the real point scoring action can be done. Um, finally, where did they come from? So this tracks where on the field physically the points were scored. Um, and the reason that you tend to want to track this is because it becomes more difficult to do certain actions from uh, different locations. A good example of this is in 2016's game, First Stronghold, there were three general areas where you could shoot a boulder. You could shoot it from right up against the batter, or you could shoot it from in the middle of the field, or you could shoot it from way back at the defensive. Um, shooting it right up against the batter was great because you couldn't get blocked by anybody in front of you. Shooting it right out in the middle of the field was not so great because you could have somebody come up against you and block you. You could get hit while you were shooting because it wasn't a protected area. And shooting it 
uh, way back at the defensive was also great because um, you couldn't get contacted when you were shooting there. So if you position yourself just right, you could always come hit the defender, um, get some penalty points, and otherwise they wouldn't be able to hit you. So that's why it's important to track the location where the, uh, the scoring action took place. Um, next, we're asking ourselves, where did every missed point go? Um, the first example of this is stopping your opponents from scoring points. Uh, one of the concepts that I didn't have a chance to touch on was that stopping your opponent from scoring a point is exactly the same value as you scoring a point uh, for most purposes. Because when you're scouting, you're trying to make decisions that will allow you to win in the match that you're playing to get you the two ranking points from winning the match, as well as to win in eliminations when winning is the only thing that matters. Um, so in that case, if you score one point and you stop your opponent from scoring 10 points, it's as if you scored 11 points because it would that's the differential that you're creating. Uh, so that's why one of the things that you want to track whenever it's possible is when you're stopping your opponents from scoring. Um, a good example from this year is there are certain robots that could only score fuel if they um, pick them up from the side hoppers. So dumping the fuel out of the hoppers would stop them from scoring those fuel because they have no ground pickup. Um, you could also block shots in 2016. That was a significant way of preventing your opponent from scoring. Um, and then another example is in 2014, during autonomous mode, everybody used to control their robot by putting their hands on their shirt like this, which let them control you know, their robot during autonomous with their goalie pull to block the autonomous shots. That's another significant way of stopping your opponents from scoring points. Um, second in where did every missed point go is stopping yourself from scoring points. This mostly tracks mistakes that a team would make. Um, and that's because if you have a team on your alliance that is going to make these mistakes, they're going to prevent you from scoring those points or they're going to prevent themselves from scoring their points. Um, and a good example is, again, in 2016, if you missed your shots, you wouldn't be scoring those points. Or in, in 2017, this year's game, if you dropped a gear after picking it up, you'd have to go get a new gear unless you have a ground pickup. Um, and that would prevent you from scoring that gear or it would take a whole bunch of time. Uh, you could also knock over tote stacks back in 2015 and that would prevent your alliance from scoring points. And, and you know, it was a real thing where there are certain teams that were just more prone to knocking over tote stacks. And that's something that you need to account for when you're scouting. The third point under where did every missed point go is uh, the more complicated one. And the way that you can conceptualize this is this tracks a team's point scoring potential that was caused by something that happened that was not any fault of their own. Um, so on an organized alliance, you'd be able to capitalize on this and convert the potential points into real points. Um, now this doesn't mean, this doesn't just mean variance. So variance would be um, there are some teams that would score one year in a match, and then five years in a match, and then three years in a match. That's a team with a lot of variance. That doesn't mean that the team has potential to score five because they're just an inconsistent team. But a, a different example would be um, in 2016, if a, team, if a team crossed over a defense that had already been done, then they wouldn't score those points. But if you organize the team in a different way with teams going over different defenses, they could have capitalized on those crosses. Or in 2017, again, if you had a team that uh, stopped scoring their gears because they were done their four rotors already, or they were done their three rotors, or whatever they chose to do, uh, you could convert those, you could convert that potential ability to score points into points if you organize your teams in that way. Um, so again, this is actions that don't necessarily show up on the scoreboard, but that would allow you to convert those actions into points if you arrange your teams just right. So let's go into a case study of how to apply these principles to one of your games. Um, so let's look at this year's game. Where did every missed point come from? Um, this one, sorry, where did every point come from? This point is pretty simple for this year's game um, in terms of what actions were done to directly score points. You could, you could do mobility, you could place gears, you could score fuel, you could climb. Those are the only points that you can score. Uh, we, we consider penalties differently because they're they're not actions that you do, they're actions that your opponents do. But those, I mean, that's another action that can put numbers up on the board. Now, what did robots do that enabled them to score points? So these are the, the actions directly leading to point scoring. 
Um, so this includes things like gear intake, fuel intake, and they could have had partners ferrying gears for them if they had a ground pickup. This didn't happen in practice, but when you're considering uh, what is possible, this is something that you need to at least have in your brainstorming session. Um, and then where did these points come from? So this means primarily in this game, uh, it means the auto gear location, but it also means the, the intake and scoring location for the gears and the fuel. Uh, for the fuel, the scoring locations, there weren't a lot of them. You could score right up against uh, the you could score right up against the goal or you could score a little bit far back against the goal, um, but there weren't really other places. For the for the gear scoring, all the pegs were pretty much the same. It just depended on where your line station was, so that uh, didn't end up being important in practice, but it's something that you still need to remember for brainstorming. The one that mattered quite a bit was auto gear location because it was much more difficult to put on one of the side uh, pegs rather than the one where you have to drive straight forward. So that's something that you definitely wanted to be tracking. Um, now, when you're thinking about where did every missed point go, stopping your opponents from scoring points in this year's game was very tough. Every year, there's this concept of defense, which is kind of just bashing people and trying to get them to mess up. Um, so this is it's something that you need to consider. In practice, very, very difficult to track. We've, we've tried a couple of different ways to do it. We've never figured out on our team an, a very efficient way of tracking defense, but it's something that you need to consider when you're brainstorming on what you want to know this year. And in some years, it's more valuable than other years. Um, a good example is in, in 2009, there was no pinning rule. So if you got pinned in the corner, you're just stuck in the corner forever. And in that year, it became very important to track who's good at pinning people, who's good at playing that bashing defense. Um, in 2017, not so much. And then causing your opponent to drop gears or miss shots, um, again, ended up being difficult to do in practice, but something that you want to think about tracking. Um, stopping yourself from scoring points, this mostly means mistakes that you can make as a team. So that means dropping gears. Uh, missing climbs is important to consider because if you, you needed to have three climbs at most events in order to win any elimination match. Um, this also means something like preparing to climb very early or scoring fuel when you could have been doing other things because any time that you spend climbing, if you have a fast, if you have like a five second climber and you line up to climb at 30 seconds, you're just wasting 25 seconds of your time when you could be cycling. Uh, similarly, if you, if you could be cycling but you're scoring fuel, you're missing out on that cycling time. And then action that could have scored points but didn't score any through no fault of your own. Um, this is always the weird one, and this is the one that it's very important to think about and to figure out a way to track this year. Um, so this means stopping gear cycling in a quals match that's being scouted because you ended up hitting four rotors already or because you didn't try to go for four rotors. Um, so this can end up with a lot of dead time for a team that they could have spent scoring gears, but they chose not to, and that was their choice, and they could have, you know, with different instruction, they could have actualized on the points differently. Being able to figure out that this is something that you need to track requires you to think about how matches are gonna play out in qualifications and in eliminations as well. Um, so this means in qualifications, you'll see teams stop going for gears after four rotors, or you'll see teams not even try for four rotors because they know they can't hit it, um, but if they need to switch strategies in elimination, they need we need to know whether they have the potential to score those extra gears. The next thing that you do is with everything in first, you need to make a priority list. So you've we've gone through this brainstorming session, coming up with all this different information, um, all these different things that can be tracked. When you're trying to figure out the way that you implement your scouting sheet, um, you need to make a priority list of all of the things that can be tracked and what's most important for your team. In our case, our priority list came out to something like this. Uh, I'll go through it pretty quickly. All these things are very easy. These are just you know numbers that you can track, numbers that you can write down. If you remember from 1678's scouting app, um, these are just the ones where you, you tap on the app and it'll it'll track that information. Fuel, uh, not not that easy, but still pretty easy because in practice there was only you know one maybe two fuel scorers, and you could track that on the blue lines. Then you come to the very difficult way, the, uh, the, the very difficult information to track. And there's no simple answer for how you end up tracking this information. Um, but with everything in first, 
this is something that you brainstorm with your team. You come up with a creative solution. You, you implement it. You iterate it. You try it again. So there's no simple way of telling you um, in every year, here are the challenge, here are the solution, in the same way that there's no simple way of telling you, here are the first game, here are the robot that you need to build. This is just something that you need to work on with your team to figure out a way to do it, and you need to test it, and you need to redo it. Um, and then we, because of the implementation that we ended up choosing that I'll go through quickly at the end, uh, we ended up having to omit things like in gear intake and fuel intake because it was, it was difficult to track and it would make the scouting system too complex. Uh, auto gear location, very easy. We ended up doing that. Fuel acquisition count, also not done because it was too difficult to do in practice. And it was very unimportant. Um, so with the final scouting sheet that we ended up with, the goal is always to be able to make an informed prediction of what every team can do for you and what they can do against you. Here's the implementation that we came up with, Team 2056. Um, the important thing that's different on our scouting sheet is that we tracked cycle times for um, every team's action. So this means this means primarily for gear scoring, how long it took for them to go to the other side of the field, grab a gear, and put the gear on. Um, what this allows us to do is capture variance across different kinds of cycles. Uh, because, for example, if, the, if there are teams that score a bunch of gears and then do nothing for a match, but they score those you know, four gears in 80 seconds, a 20-second cycle is unreal in this game. And if you're, if you're consistently doing that and then stopping, there's probably a reason for it. And the reason is probably that you're already done your, your four rotors. So if you, if you have a team like that who can run you 20-second cycles and they run you 20-second cycles in eliminations, uh, you're going to be coming out really well. And you're going to have a lot of time to do things that are not your scoring. And then if you see that you have a team, for example, that has the capability of doing 10-second uh, cycles, that shows that they have high upside and also high variance. In some situations, uh, you're going to want a team like that. Again, you can look to the presentation that Karthik gives every year at championships to find out more about uh, when you want variance versus consistency. You can look at our presentation at the 2016, 2056 Ways to Inspire conference if you want more about that. Um, but having a having an implementation like this allows you to capture that information. Um, we also covered we also covered some more information like I talked about. Uh, we covered the gears that they dropped because those are equivalent to not scoring a gear. And uh, we covered the amount of time spent climbing because if you're faster at climbing, you can have more time to do other things. We covered uh, the location that they put on their auto gear because they're not all equal. And then when you crunch all of this information, um, and if you want more information about how this sheet works, you can look at the full presentation on the 2056 website. Uh, what you get is the ability to see the number of potential cycles that a team is able to do. So, I mean, I can draw your attention to team 494 in this example where they have they have no potential cycles because they're always cycling until the last second and then climbing. Or I can draw your attention to a team like uh, 2609, which which seems to have which seems to have a very high number of potential cycles. So they're for some reason they're stopping their cycling very early, and so they have the ability to score a bunch more gears. Um, it's something that you would need to investigate, but because this is a track, you're you're able to know that you need to look at that more closely. And finally, we can look at the top two teams in this example, 1241 and 2169, uh, where, their, where their total gears, if you look at just their gear scoring, it looks like Team 494 and Team 234 are close to them in terms of their scoring. Um, but then when you add their potential, because they're going so quick, 494 drops out of the conversation. They're down by half a gear, uh, which ends up, which is a lot in this game. Two, 34 also has a bit lower potential than 1241 uh, when you include their potential gears. Uh, but it brings them closer together. So, I mean, a discussion between 1241 and 234 would be a real discussion. But if you just looked at their initial numbers of 5.3 versus 5.0, uh, maybe it wouldn't have been a real discussion. Um, so to go over it again, if you're trying to have good results, you need to make good decisions. In order to do that, you need to have a good database and to do that, you need to co collect the right data and you need the right scouting sheet for that. Um, the question on your mind whenever you're designing a scouting sheet is what will I want to know this year and not what can I scout or not you know, what information is available. You need to think about how the game will be played and what information you need to help your team 
uh, that will help you play the game better. And then finally, just have good data. Your scattering, your partners will all thank you for having the right data because it'll allow you all to make the right decisions and it'll allow you to play way better. Um, if you Again, if you want the full presentation, everything's available on the 2056 website. If you want to get in contact with me, my contact information is provided right there. So thanks. Uh, I believe we have time for questions now. Awesome. Yes, thank you very much to both Citrus Circuits um, and Oliver from uh, OP Robotics uh, for sharing their wisdom. Certainly a lot of great information there. Um, we are going to open it up for questions. So um, just a reminder to everybody that if you have a question um, and you're watching live, uh, go ahead and in the Twitch chat, put exclamation point Q followed by your question, um, and we'll go ahead and grab that. Or uh, you can tweet at us with um, at RoboSportsNet with hashtag FRCBTL. Um, or you can message us on our Facebook page, RoboSports Network. Um, so with that, I think we've got the first question coming up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not quite yet, but um, as, a, as a segue into this first question, um, one thing that wasn't mentioned um, in, in either of the presentations was pit scouting. Um, so I'll kind of throw an open-ended question to first Citrus Circuits and then um, and then to 2056 about um, how you how you take into data physical uh, take into account physical attributes about about your robots um, about the teams you're scouting. Um, yeah, this is Richard. Um, we actually, we do have a slide about pit scouting. Uh, you make the cut. Sleep, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but basically, we have a very simple. Um, pit scouting, sort of simple pit scouting system in which we're really looking for just a few attributes. We, we take pictures of robots because we discovered in the draft list, um, we, we like to know, uh, we, when we're doing the ranking, we like to know which robot it was that we're actually talking about. And so that's always helpful. Um, <clears throat> and then we're interested in the team organization. We, we rate how, how good their pit looks, how well it's run. Um, we want to know the programming language because sometimes we are concerned about uh, some programming issues if they're on our alliance. And then the thing that we really introduced um, in 2014, which we found really helpful, is there's particular aspects of the game that we may be concerned about. So in 2014, it was the assist. So we went around and we actually tested robots. Um, by passing the ball through the robots to see how quickly they could get the ball through the robot with 10, 10 times through. And we did half of the teams at, in the um, Newton division in 2014 when we did that. And we got great feedback. They said, wow, you're actually asking something very specific about the game. We love this. And uh, so we had real positive feedback and we've gone back and done that kind of testing this last year we had a climbing mechanism that we took from pit to pit and we measured teams uh, how quickly they could climb and that, and we actually end up helping teams with their climbing as well um, the, in fact this pit scouting process has led to us developing us um, something called citrus service where we go to all of the pits we bring uh, 10 students and mentors and they work on other teams robots at the competitions um, and that grew out of this pit scouting routine that we do. So it's not, we don't go around and ask for all these different attributes about the robots. We try to pick up what we want out on the field um, and just really the things that we can't see on the field is what we want in the pit scout. Yeah, and I think we do a pretty, we do a pretty similar, simple way of pit scouting. Um, we care about a couple of important things. So it's weight, programming language, wheels, uh, whether you can cheesecake them and pictures. And that's pretty much all. That's pretty much all that we care about. Yep. Um, awesome. <clears throat> yeah, so I guess we got another one. Um, with drive systems, uh, I assume you guys can look at them. Uh, so does the uh, teams that have mechanisms affect their uh, ability and chances of being picked by the top eight? Uh, at events, does that does that go into play for some of you? Um, um, so I think our team, our team, we have a perspective on this that came from 2016, or sorry, not 2016, 2013, which is if you're really, really good in your mechanum, then maybe you can get picked, but you have to be really, really good in mechanum. Um, in 2013, there was a robot that 
zipped around the field on McCann was picking up frisbees and shooting them in the goal. They were ridiculously fast. And, you know, we, we call these teams the Super McCannum team. If you can be one of these, and you can use McCannums correctly and use the, mo- the extra mobility that you get to play the game better, then by all means, go McCannum, go crazy, uh, be really good. There was a team like that on our field as well this year that we really wanted to get in the second round, but we ended up getting you know, our ninth team. Uh, but yeah, McCannums doesn't discount you from being picked. You just need to make sure that you use them in the right way and McKenna's give you a lot of mobility advantages. So if we were, um, from our perspective, as a first pick robot, I think that we'd, we would shade down the McKenna's uh, robots below some of the other drives if we had two robots of similar ability in that first pick offensive ranking. Um, on second pick, uh, they just, one of the key things that we measure for in defense is torque. Um, which is pushing ability. And those kinds of drives don't really have sufficient push to uh, play good defense. Uh, um, so, and we look at that on the field. We're measuring that sort of thing. It shows up in the data. That's part of our way of measuring defense, which is we know that you can't observe, during qualifications, you can rarely look for defense. Most teams don't play defense. So we're looking for the attributes of defense, which are things like being able to drive and get to a spot on the field reliably, or being able to push against another robot. That's been important in some, some games in some years. So those are the sorts of things that we, we look at, and that particular drive doesn't really do well in, in the pushing side. So that's why we generally don't pick them. But, but at the same time, I think at the end of the day, if, if the number one robot at the event has mechanisms, uh, I think most teams that are having good scouting systems like the two of you aren't going to overpass that robot that's amazing with that system, but they need to prove themselves, you know, via data, not via just right. having cameras. Right. Just whipping around the field isn't going to help them. Okay. So the, the next one we have, um, ask about, um, they, they say, uh, my team doesn't have a lot of uh, scouting people uh, to prepare for scouting. We can only do a couple people. Uh, what should they do in those situations where um, Citrus Circus, you guys were talking about having, uh, what was it, uh, six people for robots, two super scouters, two programmers. So you're at a scouting team of 15 to 16 people. What do you do if you only have a couple people? So the the way to approach that is to look at, again, your big questions of what is it that you're really scouting for in your strategy? Um, what, what, are the, what are the attributes that are really important to you? And you can get away with uh, relying on the OPR measure as a, in some years as a, as a reasonable approximation of the offensive output. In fact, this last weekend at the Capital City Classic, I put together two, um, two draft lists for two teams that were first time alliance captains. And I opened up the blue alliance OPR list and I said, here, this is the starting of start of your draft list. Because the OPR list was not a bad approximation of what I thought were the, you know, the ranks of the top 15 robots. And then we, and then we added some other teams beyond that. But they had a draft list which was uh, adequate and not bad. Um, and then you can, you can assign your scouts to start looking for the important traits that you're looking for um, that will match well with your robot. As I said, our first pick, you're looking for somebody who will complement what you do, and the second robot you're looking for will fill the gaps of the rest of your alliance. And so you want to try to be as efficient as possible in doing that scouting. It does help to have someone who's experienced watching the game and do that scouting. Um, I was actually able to scout. I was the scouting system at Chessie Champs because our students were all busy doing other things. But I had seen all of the other robots in five other competitions. And so it was just basically, a, and I even used our scouting scout viewer with data from the championship. So I could look up teams if I wanted to see how they were ranking. Um, so that's another way of doing that kind of scouting system. Thank OB, you. do you yeah, have any I'll, comments? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think we right. go over uh, being realistic about your resources a lot in the whole presentation. Mm-hmm. If you only have a couple of people, but you're 
you're excited about scouting and you want to do it, it's not unrealistic to just get three people together, um, watch two robots each, and you know, even if you're not doing it every match, if you get a, you know, one or two matches, three or four matches from every team, you're getting a pretty good approximation of the team's abilities, especially if you're only doing it, you know, Friday afternoon and something like that. Um, but I think a better solution for a lot of these teams is you think about what if you don't have resources, but you're building a robot. The first thing that everyone tells you to do is go contact other teams in your area, pull your resources together, pull your brains together, and, and you know, work with those good teams, work with those other teams. That's something that I think is very underutilized in scouting, where if a couple of teams got together and they had two kids each that were really excited about scouting, suddenly you have a 12-person scouting team, and suddenly you're, you're able to scout every match and get good data. Um, if you can't get that many teams together, going to talk to another team in your area that does scouting as well um, and that you want to work with. I mean, I'm sure if if some rookie team came up to our team and they were like, hey, we have these two kids, they're really excited about scouting, but we don't have any way to do it, I'd take them in. That would be great. Having two more kids who are excited about scouting, I don't, I don't see a problem with doing that, and I think that that's a great way of getting some experience in scouting and getting some data. Yeah, and definitely. Teams that have traveled to our regionals and with very small teams, we've shared scouting data with them um, because we recognize they have a limited team. Yeah. One thing I'll add on to that before we move on to the next question, um, I work with 5803 Apex Robotics and we're a pretty small team. Um, I think we're gonna be our biggest size this year at like 15 <laughs> students. Um, and we rely very heavily on parents to help scout. Um, at our competitions because we often don't have um, six students who aren't either on drive team or in the pits. Um, and so that's something that, that you can look at as well if, you know, a lot of teams consistently have parents showing up to their events, put them to work. Um, and, and if you focus on the principles that um, Citrus and, and Opie talked about, um, you'll, you should end up with a system that's simple enough and easy enough to pick up that, um, that your parents can, can after a, a couple matches, really be contributing that, that um, quality data. So that's an option too. Yeah, I think, I think what Citrus Circus does with their, uh, they call them their super scouts. I think you could take that type of a system where you're measuring the robots relative to each other within the match and kind of giving them a score base. I think uh, our team has done something like that before. We call it lean scouting, uh, where we actually scout all the robots relative to each other. Uh, so we give them a rank of six to one. And if the one robot that always is a six, they're probably the best robot there. Um, and you can average it out so you can get some kind of a list. It's uh, more of a qualitative list. Uh, but still, it's it's based on something, and you got those two students, uh, like Oliver said, that are really excited about it. They'll get really good data on that and give you something to go off of. Yeah. So speaking of being excited about scouting, our next question um, is uh, is about scouts who lose interest or walk away, keeping your scouting team motivated um, to be there. Especially, I know this is hard for teams when their robot maybe isn't performing well, either because everybody wants to be in the pits um, or because they don't feel like their job is going to be useful because, you know, they're not they're not up in the rankings. Um, Sam, you want to answer that? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so the key component of being interested or passionate about scouting is the scouts have to understand how important scouting is. And um, that's one of the biggest, um, biggest, the most important key of uh, being interested in scouting. And um, did we do, do games last year? Yeah, we did. We created a, something called the Scout Engagement System. Uh, we tested this on uh, last year's Mad Town uh, off-season competition, where we had we communicated through a Slack uh, communication platform, and we had scouts uh, theoretically bet on um, what would happen. So, <laughs> how many uh, high goals a robot will shoot, or um, if an alliance will um, breach or capture or challenge, and this kind of motivated the scouts. And we also have prizes for the uh, top top two scouts, and I guess that's a little motivation there. So when you're when you're talking about betting, you're talking about like just pride points here, right? They're they're saying oh, I think I think this team is gonna is gonna do this well, and, and yeah. you're getting bragging points out of it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. We can, I, we can I, do tally too. Yeah. I think that they handed out candy or something. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, feel pride. Oh, oh boy. Keep uh, uh, tally on their uh, phones on the memo or something. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, th I think it's a good point that making sure everyone knows the value of scouting, how important they are on the team, is, is always the best way of keeping your students engaged. Um, because if the mentors don't respect the scouting, or you know, you, you end up being in a position where your data is not being used or not being valued, no one's going to want to do it. But if you if you have your mentors valuing all of the scouts and you know constantly telling them how important their job is, and their job is very important. I think on our team, we do a good job of letting the scouts know that they're as much a member of the, on, of the team as anyone else who's doing any job on the team. Because you can't win events if you don't have good scouting in the same way that you can't win events without having a good robot. You can't win chairman's awards without having a good chairman's program. Um, so you need to be doing your job and your job is part of what's allowing us to win. Yeah, I think I think with that, uh, one of the things that uh, like I said, we do on our team is if there is a match that was won because of strategic analysis of the teams we were going against or we were with, um, and, and we were successful at that, uh, we make sure we give credit to our scouters, um, which we, we let them know, you guys are the reason we won that match. Not because of the driver, not because of the robot, but because the scouting data proved that's what was necessary to win that match. And I think you can go one step further by saying, you know, making sure the scouts see the work that you're doing. You're looking at the data between all the matches, and you can only make decisions if you have data. I mean, if, if we didn't have the database, we don't know what the team's doing. We just can't plan match strategy. It just doesn't work at all. Um, so making it known that we can only do what we're doing with our strategies because of the data um, is, a, is a good way of making sure they understand how important their job is. Which I think this leads into our next question pretty good. Um, once I have the data, how do I figure out the most useful way to display uh, it for match preparation? And how is this different than making a pick list selection? <laughs> so, um, uh, I'll answer the second question first, which of course, yeah, when you're doing pick your pick list, you're looking at the entire field of robots and then you're segmenting them. We segment them by who's going to be our first pick, who's going to be our second pick. Um, and that's a that's very different than when you're going into a match and you're only looking at six robots, three on each side. And then what we've done is we have played around on our uh, viewer tablet about what is the data summary that you want to have under each team um, that will help with the strategy. And then I think Janet can finish explaining how she uses that data. Yeah, so normally when I have the iOS VR app, I'll be able to look at it and then our programmers have programmed like visual representations. So we get graphs of like bar graphs of the relative numbers of gears they've scored in each of their matches. And I can see like what are the anomalies or like their climb percentages. I can see which matches they have climbed and which matches they have not. And if they've been climbing like more towards the end and less in the beginning, then I'll realize that, oh, maybe they're just like getting more used to the field now. And then now that they're used to the field, they can actually climb regularly. So that's how I use some of that data to help me during match strategy. And then I also, we also used to use uh, spreadsheets where we would take a raw CSV like data export from the server. And then we would have like graphs and where we would take the most important data points that we were looking at. So this would be like climb percentage and gear scored, et cetera. And then we would all display them on one spreadsheet. And then I would color code them based off of, oh, the, what the worst numbers would be like maybe red and the best ones would be green. And there'd be like a gradient where I could see, oh, so-and-so is like this good at doing this. And then from there, we would also pull data and display on like bar graphs or other graphs that show how like the relative abilities of these robots compared to all of the other robots in the game. Conditional formatting in Excel can be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, easy. If, if you're collecting the data in any kind of um, database, Excel is a, is a good one. Um, we use it on Apex, I, I think it, it looked like uh, OP uses that as well. Um, yeah, if you go to our 2016 presentation for the conference, we give a good example of the spreadsheet that we use. Um, 1114 spreadsheet is very similar and very good and available on their website. So there's lots of examples um, from other teams if you go looking for them. Awesome. Yeah, and it's it's a great way to highlight um, you know teams that are performing particularly well or particularly poorly um, as sort of a, a quick visual reference. So I think our, our last question um, is uh, coming up on the screen right now. 
does everyone scout and is it required? And I think I think this question is, um, does every t every member of your team um, that doesn't necessarily have another defined role uh, scout? Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, so we'll start with Citrus and then and then OP is 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 this something that everybody who doesn't have another job is scouting? Well, we have a and maybe it's an unusual policy, but we have a, a limited travel team. So not everybody on the team gets to travel. And so everybody has a defined role. The scouts have to test in order to get on the team. And I think that um, yeah. Sam could talk about that a bit more. Uh, yeah. So we, after we assign who are the scouts for the travel team, we always have a tr scout training session and to prep them because scouting is hard and they need experience to get good data. So uh, we have an upcoming scout training actually next week where we'll divide into two shifts because we have a lot of uh, scouts this year. And we'll have to divide into two and we train them um, using past competitions and um, we get them proficient enough so that they're ready for the scouting. And we yeah. have something called a uh, citrus service that uh, because we have so many team members, not all of them are going to be scouting. Our scouting system holds up to a maximum of 20 people, two for super scouts and the rest for scouts. And the, the other members do citrus service where they go to, down to the pits and help other teams. And we do uh, transitions to give scouts breaks because breaks are really important. I think this question is getting at two separate things. So um, the first thing is, if you're considering scout scouting as an afterthought where you have students who have no other job and they're put on scouting, that's not the right way that you conceptualize it and that's not the right way. Um, that's not the way that you're going to get good data. Scouting needs to be a priority. Um, and if you can't make it a priority, then you just need to be realistic about your resources and, you know, maybe put your resources toward your robot or your chairman's. If you if you just don't have the resources, that's totally fine, and you can work on scouting um, with a couple of students with a couple of other teams. Uh, put your resources where they're going to be most valuable to you. Uh, but if you have the students that are, if you have the the number of students that's going to allow you to scout with you know six students uh, on the on the match at one time, your scouting has to be a priority. Um, the second thing that I think this question is getting at is. Again, what do you do if you're if you're a low resource team where you don't have enough students to be scouting, or you have, uh, you know, just six students who so can take breaks if everyone gets tired? And at that point, um, again, it comes back to being realistic about your resources. And if you just don't have the students and you don't have the resources that you can dedicate to scouting, maybe you have to design um, a simpler system that can be run by just three people at once. Maybe you have to get together with other teams and you know pool your students together so everybody can get the right amount of time off so they're all fresh and able to collect the right data. Uh, but having, so certainly having scouting as a job that stragglers would take on if they have no other duties to do is not the right way to conceptualize scouting and not the right way to build um, a culture of scouting. And if you, if you just don't have the right resources, then you need to be realistic about that and come up with different solutions that are going to be different from what we're talking about. Awesome. Well, um, that will about just about wrap it up tonight. I, I want to say thank you uh, very much again um, to Oliver, Sam, Richard, um, and the rest of the, the team um, for... <laughs> sorry, I forgot your name. It's okay. Janet. <laughs> Janet. All right, there we go. Um, for coming on tonight and uh, sharing their wisdom, I think this is um, some really awesome, awesome information. Um, and they provided their contact info. Uh, if you have any further questions. So uh, on behalf of Clinton and myself with Robo Sports Network, we just want to say thank you um, for joining us tonight. And um, our next episode, I believe, is going to be on November 15th. So uh, check all the all the channels. Um, we'll be talking about um, best practices with uh, computer-aided design. Um, so that'll be a real fun one. And uh, we'll have more information coming out uh, from FIRST pretty soon. Um, and so with that, good night, folks. Bye. <laughs>